church friends, what a start. What a joy to be here with you, my dear friends, as we welcome a new team member. Ricardo, welcome to the team on electric guitar. We're so thankful to have you and look forward to how God is going to use you on this team at Neighborhood Church. You are welcome here. It is Mother's Day, and there can be a lot of joy and celebration and smiles on Mother's Day. And then there can be some sadness mixed in on Mother's Day, too. So my heart is with all of you, my dear friends. What I hope we all have had in our lives or have very soon will be a woman that has pointed us to Jesus. And so in my life, I think of my mom when I think of that person. And I thank God that my mom taught me that the love of Jesus Christ defends me. Isaiah 12, verses 2 and 3 read, Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Lord, we thank you that you are here that you are present, that you are with us in our joy and celebration. You're with us on the mountaintops. And Lord, you are with us in the valleys and our sadness and our weakness. We can rely on you. We can declare together that your love defends us. We lift up your name in Jesus' name. Amen. Surely my God is the strength of my your love defends me your love defends me and when I feel like I'm all alone your love defends me your love defends me yeah. you're my 
heart is on to fly Another way when the walls are closed When I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be was another end of fire Standing next to me Was another end of waters Nothing back to see Should I ever need to remind How I've been set free The breeze across the desert world Another died for me Is another end
Lord, you are here, you are present, you are moving. May those prison walls truly be breaking, falling and shaking the ground as we lift your name on high and declare together.
you for your goodness and your mercy that runs after us, Lord, your kindness that draws us in, in, Lord. We thank you for drawing near to us today, Lord, and we thank you for every mother, every father, every person in this place. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jan, who bring the word, God, and we pray that you speak to every heart and every mind here, Lord. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for Jesus and the cross and the blood that washes our sins. Amen. My neighborhood church kids, neighborhood kids, you are dismissed to your class. And everyone else, you may be seated. Yes, good morning and happy Mother's Day. It's great to have you with us both in person and online. My name is Jen Ashby and I'm the Executive Director of Ministries here. Before we jump into the message, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge Sung Su and Sumi Huang, who I think I saw earlier. If you're here, could you stand up for me? Oh, you came right close. Great, you can stay right there, but stay standing. Sung Su and Su Mi have been worshiping with us for about a year now. Uh, but Sung Su just recently accepted a call to pastor a Korean Christian and Missionary Alliance church in Morgantown, West Virginia, and they are making that transition imminently. Yeah, congratulations. So a small congregation of about 30 people, it'll be a bivocational position, which means he will also likely be working another job. So Mi's work is here. And so they're beginning a somewhat complex transition as they ease into this, but we're gonna take a minute to pray for them. If you're comfortable extending your hand that way, you can do that and let's bless them as God sends them out. God, thank you for Sung Su and Su Mi for their lives and for their stories and for the privilege you've given them to join you yet again in a new season of ministry. We pray that you would go before them that you would bless them and empower them. We pray that you'd give them favor, not only with this congregation that's ready and waiting for them, but for others in the community that you would have them serve and reach along with that group. We pray for good relationship uh, with the host church that houses this congregation and for favor among their neighbors and others they will meet there. We trust that you're gonna work out everything related to work and housing and timing and commuting and weather and all of that. And we look forward to all that you're gonna do in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So make sure that you greet them and bless them today. Last week, we began a new series in 1 John called Practical Love. And I shared a little bit about who I am, but also about the Apostle John who wrote this text and some of the when and where and why we have what we have here. So if you missed that message, I encourage you to go back and listen to it. If you just wanna listen, you can find it on Spotify. Uh, if you wanna listen and watch it, you can do that on our website or on Facebook or on YouTube. I grew up in a very small town in South Central Kansas called Mulvane. At the time, the population was about 4,000. And I was raised in the Mulvane United Methodist Church, which was one of the three biggest churches in town. But when you consider the population, 
That's not saying a whole lot. It was still fairly small. Everybody in my world went to the Mulvane public schools. It was the only public school option. There were no private schools and nobody homeschooled. And so the people I knew from church, I also knew from school, including the kids in my Sunday school class and the kids in my youth group and many of my teachers. My piano teacher was our church organist. Uh, And any jobs that I had growing up, whether they were babysitting or working at our one grocery store, all of, our, all of my bosses also went to our church. They say it takes a village to raise a child, and alongside my family, this was really the village that raised me. And I'm very, very grateful for that experience. That church had a pretty traditional and pretty formal pattern of worship or liturgy that they followed every Sunday morning. We would start with a call to worship inviting people into the experience. That would be followed by the invocation, welcoming God's presence and what he wanted to do there. That was followed by confession of sin and assurance of forgiveness. And then the Lord's prayer and the rest of the service flowed from there. And every week, each of these elements was plainly spelled out in our printed bulletin that we received on the way in. Now, many weeks here at Neighborhood Church, we have some of those same elements, but I'm just reflecting this morning on a little bit different style. When I say that every week we had confession of sin and assurance of forgiveness, this is what I mean by that. There would be a point in the service when everyone present would say out loud and all together something like this. Merciful God, we confess we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we've not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And then when we were done saying that all together, the pastor would say something along the lines of, Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And then we would continue on with the service. Now it goes without saying that simply mouthing those words does not necessarily mean true confession and true repentance or change was happening every week. And obviously what can start out as a really thoughtful, intentional practice is at risk of becoming a mindless routine. However, however, this practice represents something that is important to our faith and is important to our life with Jesus. This kind of practice, confession of sin, assurance of forgiveness, helps us to get real and to stay real as we're following Jesus. I think it was in the same church in youth group where I was first taught to pray using the acronym ACTS. A is for adoration. We start the prayer praising God for who he is. C is for confession. We ask the Holy Spirit to show us any sin we need to confess. Confess that to God. Ask for his strength to change. T is for thanksgiving. We thank God for what he's done. And S is for supplication, a big word for asking for what we need or want. Now, I'll be honest, these days, I don't always pray according to that acronym. Many times I simply pray, help me, (laughs) or help her, (laughs) or thank you, or praise God. But time and time again, I find myself circling back to this kind of pattern and this kind of structure. Because again, it represents something important about our faith and about our walk with Jesus. It helps me get real and it helps me stay real. Last week, I mentioned that when John wrote this book, 1 John, to the churches in and around Ephesus, there were three main heresies 
three main lies or false teachings that were circulating at the time. One of them we talked about last week, and that was that those false teachers denied the incarnation, denied the reality that Jesus was both fully God and fully human. Today's text is going to touch on the other two heresies, which are this. Those false teachers claimed to be sinless, without sin. They also failed to love others. So let's jump into the text. We're in 1 John chapter 1, and today we're starting in verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So how is it that these false teachers believed that they were sinless? Well, they bought into an early form of what we now call Gnosticism. And Gnosticism said that the spirit and the mind were what mattered, and the physical body didn't matter. The spirit and the mind were good and the body was bad and to be rejected. You can see how they had a problem with the incarnation, the fact that Jesus came in the flesh. He came in a body. Gnosticism led some of them to the conclusion that what they did in their bodies and with their bodies was of no consequence. It didn't matter. So since sin often involves the body, I use my mouth to say something I shouldn't. I use my hand to touch something I shouldn't. I use my feet to go somewhere I shouldn't. Since it's physical, it doesn't matter. It doesn't count. It doesn't count against them. Therefore, they're sinless because their spirits and their minds are pure. Now, to us today, this elaborate framework sounds like a bit of a stretch, right? Come on, Gnostics. Who do you think you're kidding? (laughs) Get real. However, I will be the first to confess that while it might not take this particular form, I have all kinds of ways of explaining away my sin. Minimizing it, ignoring it, excusing it, even justifying it. I could come up with all kinds of creative ways to basically say, ah, that doesn't count as sin. John is writing to the church here. These are presumably people who've put their faith in Jesus. And he instructs them, now that you've done that, walk in the light. Walk is a metaphor for the basic way that we conduct our lives. We are to walk in the light as Jesus is in the light, meaning we follow Jesus, we follow his commands. It doesn't mean we are perfect and never sin again. It just means the basic orientation of our lives, the basic direction we're going is toward Jesus and being like him. John actually assumes that we will sin from time to time. And that's why he gives us instructions about what to do when that happens. Confess our sins. God will forgive us and purify us. For those who put our faith in Jesus, this text is not about constantly losing your salvation and getting it back, losing it again and getting it back. This is simply about how we walk, how we conduct ourselves as Jesus' followers. We journey in the direction of Jesus and being more and more like Jesus. And when we sin, we're honest, we own it, 
We confess it to God. And God forgives us and purifies us. And then we journey on. Getting in the light involves being real about our sin and real about God's forgiveness. And let me say clearly, there's no sin too great, too dark, or too shameful for God's complete forgiveness and cleansing. Isn't that good news? In this text, John is not terribly specific about who we are to confess sin to. Are we to confess sin only to God? Or is it also to others? Well, we could certainly find some other places in the Bible where it talks about when we sin against a particular person, not only do we need to confess to God, we need to go to that person and confess and ask for forgiveness. And as far as we can, as far as it depends on us to be reconciled. Here's an example of that kind of teaching from Jesus in Matthew 5, 24. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar. First go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your gift. So when we've sinned not just against God, but also against another person, we need to confess and apologize to that person as well. And I believe that scripture says there is power in confessing to another person, even when our sin has been private, so to speak, and not necessarily against that person. James said in James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. So there is a connection between confessing to another person and healing. How badly do you want healing? How much do you want wholeness? Now, we're not talking about telling everyone everything. We're just talking about getting in the light by confessing sin to God, confessing to whoever we've actually sinned against, and even confessing private sin to another trusted person, another Jesus follower. Perhaps that's your spouse or your parent or a close friend. It doesn't just stop with confessing sin and receiving forgiveness and confessing sin and receiving forgiveness. That's really important in and of itself. But it's also meant to be a doorway to some change, to some transformation and to moving forward. Here at Neighborhood Church, we wanna be a place where all are welcome and received in our honest, authentic brokenness, sinfulness, and messiness. And this is a place of grace and mercy and realness. And we also wanna be a place where by God's empowerment, we're not stuck here but we move forward toward Jesus and being more like him. I have a friend who leads an Alliance church out on the West Coast. And one of the things this church says about their Sunday morning experience is this. We accept everyone right where they are and yet expect everyone to heal and grow knowing God is not done with any of us yet. Accept and expect. I really like that. Accept and expect. Those are the kinds of things that happen when we get in the light. I'm going to go so far that this whole thing of getting in the light and walking in the light isn't only about sin. It's also about getting in the light about other parts of our stories and other parts of our lives. I mentioned last week that I am in a doctoral program, a doctor of ministry program. And I knew before I even applied to this program that an emphasis of this program is on the soul of a leader. And so I knew this program would not just be about learning leadership strategies. I was gonna have to go to some places in my soul and in my story that are not comfortable to go to. And with fear and trepidation, I applied to this program and I got in and sure enough, our very first class, we were asked to share, not with the whole class, but just with two classmates and our professor, 
we were asked to share one or two places in our story where we've experienced grief and in those places we don't yet see God's redemptive hand working through that loss. And I knew immediately what those places in my story were. Couple situations that happened years ago and are by no means the worst things that ever happened to me. But when I thought about those situations, I just felt crummy and I didn't know why. I'd already confessed everything I knew to confess. (laughs) Repented of anything I thought I could repent of, both to God and to other people. But still, when I thought about those things, I just felt crummy. And so with these two classmates and this professor, people I had just met, but I chose to trust, I talked about these things pretty openly. Prior to that, I'd only talked about them with another person minimally because it was so painful. But with these folks, I did it, held nothing back. There was a lot of ugly crying on my part. It was not a particularly dignified day for me. (laughs) And they listened and they asked some questions and they prayed with me and they said, Jen, here's what we think happened. In both these situations, you experienced rejection and you internalized that as shame. And you've been carrying that around for a while. And they prayed for me. And they verbally broke off shame in Jesus' name. And something happened that day. And I am different. And now when I think about those situations, they still make me sad. But I don't feel crummy. And I don't worry about running into those people from those situations anymore. That is the kind of thing that can happen when you get in the light and when you walk in the light. Let's keep going. Picking up in chapter two, verse three. We know that we've come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says I know him but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing to you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they're going because a darkness has blinded them. John repeats his point several times in these few verses. And the point is that what we say and what we do need to be consistent. We need to get consistent, especially when it comes to the way we treat other people, specifically other Jesus followers, but the case could be made for how we treat everyone. Check this out, verse four. Whoever says but does not do. Verse six, whoever claims must also live. Verse nine, anyone who claims but hates. As the text says, this was not a new idea for John's listeners, not a new idea for us, but it's more true than ever before because both they and we are living on this side of Jesus's life on earth. In the Old Testament, the word for righteous or righteousness didn't have so much to do with one's own personal private piety. Righteousness had to do with how one treated other people. And so a righteous person was one who treated others honestly, fairly, justly, and with dignity. Jesus really drove this point home when he was addressing the Pharisees, some of the religious Jews. I'm gonna paraphrase this for you, but it comes from Luke 11. Jesus said, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish. That was a religious rule. 
but you're not generous to the poor. You tithe and give resources to the temple, but you neglect justice and love. You create more religious rules for people to follow, but you do not help them. John is saying, if we've said yes to Jesus, we're following him in the light, our overall trend is going to be towards becoming more like him and treating others the way he treats them with love. And if that's not happening in our lives, then we need to do a very sober reevaluation before God and ask his help to make a change. We need to get consistent. And it's not an instant change where we're suddenly loving everyone well. And we're not talking about loving perfectly. But as we walk in the light, an outcome is that we will love others well. And it applies to the people closest to us in our own household, in our church, on our street, in our office, in our classroom. But it also includes people and groups we don't even know personally. But the way we think about them, speak about them, act toward them should be characterized by love. This text tells us that if we're following Jesus, there is no room for hate, and it's not even about being neutral. To get consistent, we actively love other people. Duplicity is one word for when we say one thing and we do something else. Or we act one way in one situation in a very different way in another situation. In this case, duplicity would mean that we say we follow Jesus, but we treat people badly or show no concern for those in need. And God, who is only light, sees right through that duplicity. And eventually, so do others. If that's the way we function in duplicity, eventually our households will see it, our friends and acquaintances will see it, our coworkers, our classmates will see it. We might be kidding ourselves, but we're not fooling anyone else for very long. If being consistent and loving well sounds really hard, then you are tracking well with me. You are very realistic. <laughs> Because it is very hard. I would say it's actually impossible to be perfectly consistent and to love as well as we're being called to love. If it's impossible to do in our own strength. But those of us who said yes to Jesus have within us the Holy Spirit empowering us to live differently as we ask for and depend on his enablement to be consistent, to live well. I want to give you a negative example and a positive example of what we're talking about this morning. To get real, we get in the light and we get consistent. Maybe you know the name Ravi Zacharias. Ravi Zacharias was a famous evangelist, part of our denomination, Christian and Missionary Alliance. He was world renowned. He spoke to huge audiences. He led a very influential and large organization. And Ravi Zacharias died of cancer in 2020. In 2021, huge amounts of evidence revealed that he had used his power to abuse female massage therapists in the US and abroad for over a decade. And sometimes he paid those women off with monies people had given to his ministry. The effects on the people he abused were devastating. And when this all came out, the effects on his family, on the church, on spiritual seekers who've been following his lectures, the effects were and are Tragic. Rabbi Zacharias was brilliant and gifted. He said so many 
great things. God used him in spite of himself. But at some point along the way, he stopped walking in the light. And he led a double life, a duplicitous life. He was not consistent. He did not love well. He was not a righteous man at the end. Now I want to tell you about someone among us who is leaning into loving well, who is leaning into being even more consistent with what she says and what she does. Luz Raglan, who some of you know, posted this on her Facebook page about two weeks ago, and I told her that I would share this. For the past 12 years, I've been going to neighborhood church, now more frequently, I've been praying for guidance and God lit a fire in me while I was in France on a missions trip. He's been opening up conversation for me. While I was in Grand Turks for a spring break, I met Ida from Rockville. What are the chances, by the way? We had a great conversation about the farmer's market, neighborhood church, and Jesus. Then, in Grand Turks, I met Jen and Clara from Durwood. (laughs) And we were able to talk more about neighborhood church. I think I've been hashtag transformed, hashtag empowered, hashtag launched by Jesus. This week at our missions team meeting in the cafe, we're sitting around the table talking and Luz mentioned that she started going regularly to a laundromat that is nowhere near her home. But she's going to this particular laundromat because there's a lot of Spanish speakers there and Luz is a Spanish speaker. And so she's going there regularly to meet people and share with them. She also mentioned she has organized the neighbors on her street in Clarksburg to get together on a particular day to pack bag breakfasts for the men at the emergency shelter. I think that Luz would be the first one to tell you this kind of thing is really messy. (laughs) It's really messy, but I trust that you can hear that God is at work in and through Luz. She's leaning into consistency with what she claims, that she follows Jesus and how she treats people and she wants to love well. And I say, go God and go Luz. John is telling the people in these churches around Ephesus and he's telling us, get real. Get real, get in the light, and get consistent. Fortunately, he's not telling us to do that without empowering us to do it (laughs) and providing us abundant forgiveness when we misstep. When I was living in Nyack, New York, I was attending a church that had come through some hard things recently and was being led by an interim pastor who was trying to bring some healing and some change to this church. And at the end of every Sunday morning service, he would say, okay, church, tonight at the Sunday evening service, we're gonna share communion together. We're gonna have the bread and the juice to remind us of Jesus's body and Jesus's blood. And I want you to spend the afternoon doing what 1 Corinthians 11 says. I want you to examine yourselves and seek the Lord and confess to him and confess to others if needed anything you need to. As far as you can, this afternoon, you get reconciled with others. And then you'll be prepared to come to the communion table tonight and to celebrate around the bread and the body of Jesus in an appropriate way as the scriptures teach. And I only attended that church for maybe eight or nine months, one school year, and there was at least one Sunday afternoon that I needed to make some phone calls so I'd be in a right place to receive communion in the evening. I am not building up to an announcement to say, please come back tonight, we're gonna have communion. But I am building up to say, next Sunday morning, we're gonna have communion together. And there will also be an opportunity for you to be prayed for and anointed for healing if you'd like that. We always try to give you a a few seconds before we serve communion or we, before we pray for you uh, to confess, etc., and sort of get things in order. But this week, instead of giving you a few seconds, we're giving you seven days. 
You have seven days to prepare for next week's communion and prayer for healing. Those are both things that we enter into after we've come into the light and after we've gotten consistent. No one can drag you into the light. (laughs) It's not my job to try to convince you of your sin or some other aspect of your story or try to convince you uh, to confess to God or to anyone else. That's the Holy Spirit's role. But I can testify to you that there is great freedom and peace in the light with no secrets. There is connection and community in the light that you can't find anywhere else. The enemy of your soul would love to convince you that it is safer to stay in the dark. He is a liar. And the Holy Spirit beckons you to come out into the light with God and with others. No one's looking for perfection. No one's looking for perfection. Just step all the way into the light and then come back next week ready to celebrate around the communion table and ready to seek God together for healing. Let's pray together. Jesus, we know this morning that we need to understand the reality and the weight of sin so that we can understand the reality and the weight of forgiveness. And Jesus, we acknowledge this morning that that forgiveness is available to us in abundance because you are, as this text says, the atoning sacrifice for our sins, the substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. That the one that we have heard, that we have seen with our eyes, that we've looked at and our hands have touched, was obedient all the way to death. Walk that path all the way through and took our sin and punishment upon yourself and rose again, conquering sin and death and Satan and now welcomes us into all that you've achieved. And so we honor you and we honor your life and your death and your resurrection and your ascension. Help us to find our place in it and to walk in the light. We pray these things in your name. Jesus' name, amen. Stand with us as we declare together that Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. We thank you, dear Jesus. You paid it all for us. Because Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. He washed it white as snow. Thank you, Lord. I hear the Savior. And I hear the Savior say.
I could come and be in the light. And Lord, I know for myself there is fear that is wrapped up in being in the light because there is pain, not only for myself, but there might be pain for those around me, for those that I love. And Lord, you, you have not promised that there won't be pain, but you have promised that there will be eternity of restoration and of healing that Lord you are making us into the creation that you had originally in mind so Lord continue to draw us into the light continue to draw us closer to you and Lord if there is pain may we focus on the eternity of restoration We lift all of this up to you this morning, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you guys so much for joining us this morning. If anyone does not know me, my name is Tim. I'm the Director of Student Ministries here at Neighborhood Church, and we're really glad that you're here with us and, and joining us this morning. Uh, if this is your first time with us, or if you've been here since the doors open, um, or anywhere in between, we'd love for you to grab a Connect card, which is in the seat back right in front of you, uh, if you're in the front row, or you might have to reach really far, but you'll you'll get it. Uh, fill out as much information as you feel comfortable with. Um, and once you've filled that out, you can drop it in the offering box right up here, right after the service. This is just a great way for us to connect with uh, those who are attending with us. Um, and we love to connect with you and pray for you. There are prayer cards as well, and you can grab one of those, fill those out as well. Uh, there are a ton of great things happening at the church, uh, at the church, around the church, in the church, through the church. Um, and we want you to be able to keep up with all of that. You can follow us on your favorite social media site. Um, the ones that we are on are at the top of the screen. Another great way is to subscribe to our newsletter. It comes out every Friday, uh, and you can see what's going on in the church, things that are coming up, things that you can sign up for. It's a great, great way. You can go onto our website and, and subscribe to that newsletter and get information there. Thank you so much uh, for not only the, the, your time and your talents, but your financial giving, all the ways that you give, all the ways that you all give help us um, collectively as a church continue to reach our neighbors and the nations and and that's our passion here at neighborhood church and so thank you so much for that um, if you are a mother happy mother's day in any form of the word of mother happy mother's day uh, hopefully you received a, uh, a gift certificate in the mail for the farmers market if you did not we are sorry we missed you but we didn't miss you at the same time we wanted to do it in person um, so we have certificates out here at the welcome center uh, if you did not get one in the mail be sure to stop by and and we'll give one of those for you it's good for our farmers market which is a great great thing it happens every Saturday speaking of the farmers market um, it is a great opportunity to come out not only do some fun shopping but it's a great opportunity to volunteer uh, connect with people here in the church and connect with people in the neighborhood and so for this next week we're going into week four of our farmers market for this season uh, we have all the volunteers we need for this upcoming week but there are many many more positions that we need help with in weeks to come so be sure to go you can scan this QR code for more information or you can go on to our website and check out more there uh, our students, our uh, high school students are going on a trip this summer in July. They're going to a life 
Conference. And now, this is a conference put on by our denomination, the Christian Missionary Alliance. It happens every three years. Um, and they typically change the city that it happens in this year. It's in Orlando. It's going to be a great time. We have 11 students going, and we're really excited. So um, we have another fundraiser coming up for them next Sunday. We're going to do a car wash. We're going to do it right after church in the lower lot. So if you don't have any plans on Saturday, go find a field, drive around, tear it up, get your car really muddy, uh, make sure you own it first. Don't damage other people's property. But uh, then come on Sunday uh, and after church, uh, we're going to do a car wash right down here. And donations are greatly appreciated. Uh, all the proceeds go to helping our students go on that trip. And so it's a really fun time. For that trip, we are also in need uh, of two more volunteer uh, adult leaders to go with us. Uh, my wife and I are going. Uh, we need another male leader and another female leader. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, please come up and talk to me after the service. You can reach out by phone or email as well um, So if that is something you are interested in. If you have a kid in neighborhood kids and you dropped them off this morning or, or they went down, um, they don't need to be picked up until 1145. Uh, and by need, it's like, don't pick them up till 1145 because they're still getting an awesome lesson and stuff like that. So you've got some time this morning to hang out, grab some coffee, grab some mamosas um, and some, some treats if we have and just enjoy some great conversation. Thank you guys so much for joining this, joining us this morning. We'll see you next week.